Carnival means far more to Peter Minshall, the artist. And I'm not mouthing these words because Peter holds a diploma in theatre design, did brilliantly at the Central School of London. <clears throat> and, um, you know, from time to time we keep reading glowing reports about his various achievements. In my opinion, and I've known Peter for many, many years as a friend and colleague, Peter Minshall was born to create. That's heavy to take <laughs> on. <laughs> and I don't know what vision you hold of Carnival, but as far as Peter Minshall is concerned, he sees it as an art form of communication and to date has been lecturing on the subject of March, I believe, to the UK Women's Club and the American Women's Club. Peter, where were you? Yes. And to the or to a group of students at the university. Excellent. Now, where were you coming from? What were you saying? Were you analysing the carnival, for heaven's sake? Well, yes, I hope so, but in doing that, I think I was analysing myself, or rather the other way around. By analysing myself, I was perhaps analysing carnival in a search for my own being, my own words as an artist. I was perhaps learning the language of Mars in a search for my own vocabulary, perhaps through Mars. I was finding my first utterances, that is recognizing them, feeling a sense of consciousness about the Mars. Funny, you know, people say carnival. I prefer to say Mars because carnival has, speaking of words, such awful connotations in my own mind. In the UK, for example, carnival is paper streamers and balloons and uh, Jim Carner, perhaps, and nothing, nothing like the carnival, nothing like the thing that we call carnival. In Brazil, for example, the word carnival has a different connotation. And here, the word mass for me means a lot more. It, 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 it has a greater depth. It has connotations that are directly and distinctly Trinidadian. And the consciousness that I mentioned a moment ago is the consciousness of that mass, its power, its force, in terms of communication, its very wide vocabulary. It moves from the basics of Jouvet, the Jab Malassi, which is true, true theatre, through the satire of old mass into the purely visual splendor if you want to leave it at that of a tuesday afternoon a sunny tuesday afternoon in trinidad a sunny carnival tuesday afternoon is truly a spectacular event but it is more than just retina spectacle i think it goes a oh, lot peter. more deep oh, peter you still have a way with the words go ahead please uh, well, I, I forgot how this all started off. <laughs> now, if we are to stick with the theme of carnival, and I want to stay here, I'm going to take you back in time. I might be getting a bit older, but the memory is still okay. <laughs> now, in 1967... Not only the memory. Okay, thank you, sir. That <laughs> was a vision for compliments. Now, in 1967, Ingrid Anderson was the carnival queen. You designed her costume once upon a time, and I remember even then commenting on the mood of the costume. Now, did you learn any lessons from this experience, and I'm sure it was, which you have since applied to more complex designs? I could think of that breathtakingly beautiful costume, the hummingbird, which was worn by Sherry Ann Guy in 1974, and the, uh, the little carrot by, by Jose Samurai. I remember I was doing the commentary and I just kept saying, hey, hey, look at that, look at that. I, I, I was speechless, really. And I'm just quoting two examples. That's very kind of you, Hazel, to be so enthusiastic. It's funny that you should choose those three examples. Uh -huh. And let's start with the first, Once Upon a Time. Time. In fact, I think, and I'll be very truthful here, Once Upon a Time grew out of feeling of vengeance will be thine, lad. From the year before, when I did a carnival costume in which the elements and Wayne Barclay succeeded in putting me into the ground as far <laughs> as I was. Um, I did a costume called the White Peacock, which was all line and a rather lovely thing on its own, but unfortunately, consisting mainly of a train. And I wasn't into the wisdom of putting plastic on the bottom of a train yet. And in fact, Pamela walked on that stage that night as a white mm -hmm. peacock. But that afternoon, I you see, it had that. rained. 
-hmm. And uh, Pamela succeeded with a train of her peacock tail in mopping the stage up for everyone that followed and in so doing turned her peacock tail into a cart, literally, and yes. was fairly well dragging it along yes. behind and using every I little bit of this. strength. I have a vivid memory of this, you and, know. And um, it was a time for tears. But as I say, a time for vengeance. It, it, it taught me, when I say vengeance, I mean vengeance upon myself for having been such a damn fool in the first place. And the next year, I reapproached the whole Carnival Queen thing, and I wasn't here. I was a student at the Central in London, and I, I remember clearing my desk of all the Shakespeare and the Brecht and putting a sign called Carnival over it and getting to it. And uh, for inspiration, I went right back to those fancy Indians of old that I remember distinctly as a boy. I remember them so clearly. They, in fact, used pram wheels to bear their masts down the street. They didn't carry them. This was long before the controversy of wheels arose. They would take the wheels off prams and build their structures on them. And those fancy Indian headpieces were always circular, always circular, with great intricate designs of beads and wonderful slashes of mirror around the costume and ostrich feathers and combinations, color combinations of white and black and blue. I'll slip in here. I think one of the greatest costumes I've ever seen um, in terms of kings of carnival was one that John Humphrey did several, several years ago, the king of the snow kingdom. Mm. And that too had that fancy Indian mm -hmm. feeling with lots of reflective surfaces. And really it was essentially round and was based entirely on traditional forms of carnival. Anyway, along came Indri in Ingrid Anderson and instead of putting on her the teepee and several canoes and squaws behind, I put on her the butterflies of uh, Titania and several butterflies and gnomes and palm fronds and little frogs and batty mamzelles and hummingbirds trailing right down to the end, all in a sort of magic bubbling stream that miraculously cascaded out of a tree. And uh, it was quite a... Uh, uh, a Jose of a mass. <laughs> Mind you, it's funny, you know, people often look at a mass and say that looks like a Jose. Yeah. And I don't know why they do this derogatively, because I think if a ma I think a Jose is a very beautiful thing. Anyway, that's diverting. Um, yeah, once upon a time, and a hummingbird. Well, I won't go into a long history on that particular hummingbird, but that was based on the traditional carnival bat. Over a period of years, it developed from brown cotton and cane to blue mauve, violet and green lamy, and several bits of cane instead of the original three that were used on the wings of the bat. And then two Jose Samaru as the little carib, a purely imaginary thing that rides on the back of a scarlet ibis. That was based on a traditional form, the borokit. I'm not saying that traditional forms are necessarily sacred, but they do have a lot mm -hmm. to teach us. Now, I want to talk about your involvement with Carnival, uh, Peter, outside of Trinidad. For example, London, your second home. Hmm. I'm thinking of Mass in May at the Commonwealth uh, Institute and the uh, Notting Hill Festival. Is it not a turn-off to try to microscope into an enclosed area, the free-flowing street theatre of a Trinidad Carnival? Or is, is uh, turn-off the right word? I don't know. Well, it's... It's a challenge, mm -hmm. let me put it that way. You're dealing with one form of theatre that is perfectly legitimate in its own right, which is carnival, and another form which is equally legitimate, which is the theatre that happens on the boards of the stage. Um, it's funny, when I first grasped the idea of carnival being a people's theatre of the streets, uh, one or two folk kind of didn't know where I was coming from. They said, carnival isn't theater. Mind you, they couldn't quite say what it indeed was. And I think this was because their understanding of the word theater was not perhaps quite as broad of, uh, as mine. As soon as you have a, a performer audience relationship, you have a form of theater. You can't escape that fact. It exists. It, it, it is. Anyway, um, the turn off or the turn on or the challenge mm -hmm. of taking mass from off the street onto the stage. It is not so much a matter of just lifting what happens on the street and putting it on the stage. It is being very selective about what in fact can bridge that translation, shall we say, from one language to another. The theater of carnival, the theater of the streets, 
consists not only of the people in the costumes who, let us say, pay their money to perform for others, which is a wonderful twist, whereas elsewhere they pay their money to see other, mm -hmm. others perform. We know where the true joy mm -hmm. is. I was having an argument the other day with a taxi driver. Not an argument, a discussion. I said, now, who truly gets the joy? Olivier or his audience? Oh, dear. But of course, Olivier. Yes. He has the real yes. turn on. <laughs> anyway, um, you take this theater of the streets that we call Carnival. It consists of the people on the pavement, the people on the road, the bear, the rum, the snow cones, the pelau. It consists of everything. The pelau of people, if you want to call it that. It is a whole river going down the street. And every, is the river coming down? And everything is in, coming down, it, yes. it is in that river, and there's very little control. Now, if out of that you can be selective and take this piece or that piece, without, shall we say, bleeding it or, or sapping it or destroying its original essence, without overdressing it, without, oh, it's like a salad, to speak of dressing, <laughs> if you if you just kill it with, with too many additives, what's the point of having a salad? Do you know what I mean? But the young man next to me has brought some color to Dartmouth. His name is Peter Mitchell, and he's designed some gorgeous costumes for a play they're putting on here during carnival season called The Birds. Peter, you're a Trinidad native, and you're up here in the cold country. Why? Well, as you said, to design the birds, it's, it's uh, a strange point to reflect on, but at this very moment in Trinidad, Things are really waxing warm for our renowned carnival down there. Uh, I was there a year ago to the day doing a band of costumes for 2,000 people, Paradise Lost, which did very well in the carnival. And did it win an award? Yeah, it, it was the band of the year. And it, it's very odd being here, winter, snow, one of the worst winters uh, in recent history, and doing a, a different kind of carnival uh, theme altogether. A different kind indeed, because the things that you have done with these costumes, all of which represent some form of bird, most of which are recognizable to all of us. But let me ask you, uh, how much complexity is there to them? They obviously are difficult to get into. They obviously took a long time to make. They took a little bit of figuring out. It was one thing producing designs on paper with the help of fellow designer Carolyn Ross and the guidance of the director. It was another thing taking them into the costume shop and turning them into practical realities. And yet another thing uh, sort of persuading the students to be corseted and padded and high heeled to get onto that stage. They have about 16 different birds in the play. Which one would you think was the most difficult for you, most complex to get together? Oh, each one, one by one, had its problems because, uh, well, pigeons are big-breasted and partridges are mono-chested and macaws are uh, heavy in the rare. And each one presented a different set of problems. And it was not so much a case of um, simply padding and clothing, but it was padding, clothing, winging and tailing. And uh, you put those four things together and you, 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 you have mathematical problems almost that have to Each be sorted out. Each one of them was a separate challenge in itself. Yeah, yeah, some of them were more simple than others. Like, for example, the raven was fairly straightforward, but you move from one extreme to the other and you go to guys like Turkey with his sort of gobble falling all over the place. I mean, it, it was quite quite problematical at times. I think things, some of these things might attract the, the uh, women's eye. They might become passions at some point in the future. They have been fashions at some point in the past because uh, the, the approach to these was uh, not necessarily to make them totally birds. I think the trick was to hit it somewhere halfway between bird and human so that Mr. McCaw becomes somewhat Pickwickian with his great barrel chest and Madame Partridge is very much the monobusted Victorian lady, whereas the delicate little um, nightingale is, is, is more sort of um, 14th century. And one just sort of splashed about in, 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 in the history book as far as references. What about the high heels? They all seem to walk in a very strange way. Were the heels put on for that reason? The high heels, I, I think, were perhaps, um, you know, you, you keep talking about the design and the color and the exotica of the thing. I think the high heels are, in, are one of the most important decisions. And I, I can't remember how and when that idea came, but once it was accepted, it, 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 it could not be, I mean, it was just the absolute necessity of having those heels to give those people that kind of bird walk. What about the pigeon? Is that that? Is that well, uh, she really looks pigeony. Well, yes, and she's she's uh, about uh, she's hidden under about six inches of padding there, and uh, the 
the, the, the idea behind the pigeon, again, going back to history, was to make her rather like a medieval nun. But of course, in, in the greys of the pigeon, with that little bit of a distance around the head. The flamingo now seems to play more or less the lead role. You've done a rather unique thing with the thread. The flamingo is about the differentest of the lot. And uh, the neck of the flamingo is forbidding. I mean, the guy couldn't wear it on his head, so uh, one had him Where's carrying it in his hand. Now, you've made the raven somewhat ominous looking, as they usually are if they're in the flock, but he seems to be always in a very aggressive mode. I, I, well, a raven is a black bird with bits of iridescence and bright yellow eyes. I think, I think the actor here is the one who is to be thanked for the ominous quality because he takes that costume and, and makes it live. From a design standpoint, I, I took a chance that I've never taken before in the theater or anywhere else of um, just dealing with each bird individually, color-wise, but uh, hoping that the, the treatment of their wings, which is exactly the same throughout, it's, it's a very fluid fan, would collectively um, make them one statement. And I think this works. I think, uh, you know, when they all raise their wings, they become a chorus or a flock. Now, one thing I noticed that's a little bit different in this play is when you look down at the area where everyone dresses and comes out to get ready to go on stage, instead of having, you know, good luck or break a leg, which is a show business term, they just have a big sign up there that says, wing it. Yeah, and, and you get every kind of bird cliche coming into our regular conversation with each other. Like I've, I've, I've said so many times, quite uh, um, unconsciously, oh, I don't give a poop. No. Uh, And we'd like to thank designer Peter Minchel for our costume and for the play, and we'd like to thank the birds at Dartmouth. Brilliant, brilliant, Peter. This is what I call the, the magic of television, you know, from the wintry setting to the bright lights of Studio B, mainly for women, my guest, my very dear friend, Peter Minchel. But, Peter, what was the reaction of the American-based Trinidadians uh, to all this? Because I wish to tell you that this film was seen coast to coast throughout the United States. Well... Uh, that interview was done, and I heard whispers round about Dartmouth that it was going to be used coast to coast, and I thought... <laughs> yeah. I'm a celebrity, I'm a celebrity! <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought, you know, by that time I'd been in Dartmouth for about uh, four or five months, and I thought, very American thoughts, I thought, ah, oh, gee, Minch, wow! You know, I thought, <laughs> no. hey, man! <laughs> you know, anyway, um, one morning I'm, I'm kind of bumming around the wardrobe, and when I say the wardrobe, in, 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 in the parlance mm. of theatre, the wardrobe is where they make the costumes, or the costume shop, if you want to call it that. And uh, comes a shout from Margaret's office, hey, Peter, Peter, there's a, there's a long-distance call here from you, from New York. So I hurry along thinking, wow, somebody wants to talk to me all the way from New York, that's great, you know. I still have that very little kid's thing about long-distance mm -hmm. calls. They're special. Yes. Uh, I, I think if I lose that special <laughs> long-distance calls, I've lost something very, very <laughs> worthwhile. So I sort of... By the way, Betty Hayes had a lovely thing about long-distance calls in the paper some time ago. Very good. What's the weather like? <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> well, anyway, there's this voice on the other end, and it's, it's quite a distinct voice when you put the name of the person to it. It's, hello, Peter. Peter Boy, I just see your show. Jeffrey Hall. Jeffrey Hall, exactly. <laughs> and I saw him. And well, let me tell you, Peter, I saw him on the Johnny Carson show some time ago. It was last year or some time ago. I kept telling my friend, that's my friend. That, that, that's Jeffrey Hall. Sure. You know, yeah. I was so proud, yes. Well, there was Jeffrey on the phone, and he, he, he was, <laughs> you know, as thrilled as I was about the Birds um, TV coverage, and he thought it had been uh, an excellent uh, this, that, and the other, and gave me many verbal pats on the back for that little thing that we just saw. And it was darn nice of Jeffrey to go to the trouble to ring up and say, hey, kid, good job, well done. Now, we are now in the area, I take it, of theater design. You just watched that bit there on the birds. And your interest in theater design began with productions with the Light Operatic Society. Mm -hmm. Now, let me see, the Trinidad Dramatic club, the company of players. This was in the late 50s and early 60s. Then you left for England, uh -huh. where you've carved a name for yourself and for Trinidad as well. Now I know you and I'm demanding an answer. I want to hear something about your achievements. 
in this area? Well, achievements. Pick well. two out of the hat, then. <laughs> two. Um, two. Because you've been involved in a number of splendid productions, Peter. Okay. Let's be serious. Uh, I've got two. I could not in any uh, selection of... Can we find another word besides achievements? It's a funny word, that. Anyway. Um, <laughs> you find the word. <laughs> uh, two uh, occasions, which I remember particularly well. The first was the first really uh, big step in the right direction in terms of my theater involvement. And it was a wonderful opportunity. And in fact, Hazel, it came out of Once Upon a Time. So I, I picked the right example I there. remember going with my portfolio uh, along to Peter Darrell's studio, having been sent there by Michael Codron. So he said, oh, this is a chap you've got to see. He's doing something. I'll be very interested in your work. I was just a little theater designer, you know, sort of trying to show my work around. And he turned the pages and said, yes, that's marvelous, that's fantastic. And then he turned one page and, and I just slipped this in thinking, ah, oh, shucks, why not? And there was this photograph of Ingrid Anderson coming down from the heavens as a magical Titania and touching the hallowed earth of our Carnival Queen stage at Carnival, Queen's Park Savannah. And he said, wow, I like it, I like it. And he was then about to embark on Beauty and the Beast, and he asked me to join the crew. And it was Beauty and the Beast, uh, an original ballet, which marked the transference of Western Theatre Ballet to Scotland, and it became Scottish Theatre Ballet. And Peter did the choreography, and Minch did the designs, and the music, wonderful music by Thea Musgrave, and the scenario by Colin Graham. And I did rather well out of that. Really nice reviews. And then the other thing was... Fairly more recent, it was Play Mass by Mustafa Matura, which was mm -hmm. done at the Royal mm -hmm. Court with quite a star-studded Trinidadian cast. And I am proud to have been among them as the designer of costumes. And those costumes were real fun. There was a group among them that uh, had to represent Carnival, say, of the late 50s, but rustic, earthy Carnival, folksy Carnival. And you cannot imagine the joy I had in going through the <laughs> shops of London and using things like brightly colored plastic scouring pads and, and crown corks beaten down and colored and, and parakeet mirrors and a motley of things to enhance those designs. And they caused a storm. The reviewers put their hands together and clapped loudly. And... That kind of thing also helps one um, along on one's journey as one looks at the mass and, and wants to say to others, hey, look with me and share my enjoyment. Well, it's nice when people do share it. It's really rewarding. I always say some things are better shared, Peter. And we've been talking. I've enjoyed this. Really, I have. We have introduced none of the issues or non-issues of Carnival, uh, Soka versus Calypso and that sort of thing, but... Uh, I want to give you a little dig. I want to talk about your, or a bit briefly, about your 1978 presentation, Zodiac. Now, isn't this an overworked theme? I mean, coming after the Lee Hyung Minshall combination of Paradise Lost, I mean, Paradise Lost was an experience. A bombardment of the senses, total and entire and complete, Minch. Well... How do I answer that one? Hazel, Paradise Lost was a grand theatrical experience. It was opera, with all the trappings of opera. Well, with Zodiac, I've tried to remove most of those trappings. I've tried to discard the sequins, the lames, the braids, to get right down to the basics. It's as though I had said to myself, here are several brightly colored blocks. They're good enough to play with. Go on, play with oh, them. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, what do I say? How do you hold a moonbeam in your hand? Peter, you've been a long, long time enjoying me on the set of Mainly for Women. Thank you, ma'am. This encounter has been worth it. Take care, my darling. Keep sweet. Mm. Wow. <laughs> and uh, in just a moment, and next on Mainly for Women... 
three lovely contestants in the San Fernando JC Carnival Queen competition 1978. Keep you in 